Um, I'm Matt Jones. I hope m m most of you know me by now. Um, with me from Stack HPC is Matt Pryor, um, the technical lead for Azimuth. We're here to give you an update on some exciting new changes coming for Jasmine Cloud. So first, just to explain for those who don't know what the Jasmine Cloud is. Um, so it's based on VMware integrated OpenStack. Um, we have both a ma managed part and an external part. The managed part is a platform as a service. So this, for example, gives uh, tenants the ability to provision Psy machines. The external cloud is an infrastructure as a service offering. This um, sits outside the firewall, which allows tenants to have root access um, and the flexibility to provision their own infrastructure. We also have our uh, cluster as a service system, which uh, gives tenants building blocks to um, create their own clusters, for example, identity and Kubernetes clusters. So um, we currently have two pieces of software which um, uh, attempt to make using our cloud easier. Um, we have our cloud portal, which is a simplification to the Open, OpenStack Horizon portal. Um, th th this has been in production for, I think, seven or eight years now. Um, and we also, as I mentioned, we have our <laughs> cluster as a service system, which is about four years old. Um, a large piece of, piece of work that we completed re re recently, which Matt alluded to yesterday, was the migration, or Adrian, um, um, was the migration from Via 5 to Via 7. Um, uh, this was a large, challenging piece of work. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to all tenants who were involved in that. Um, there are uh, some issues and li limitations around our existing system, which mainly revolve around our cluster system and the fact that it has proved to be quite difficult to maintain and so it started to be quite outdated. Um, th this was really highlighted during the cloud migration and it accounted for a large proportion of the total time to migrate our cloud services. So the... The reasons for this is um, partly because it's a, it's ended up being a bit of a stagnant system that we've only been able to, to m maintain and not able to improve on what's there. Um, and updating versions of the components has proved to be um, quite ch challenging. Um, this has all meant that we've been slow to roll out new versions of, of services. For example, um, our version of Kubernetes is starting, starting to get quite behind now. So to tackle this, we've been investigating using uh, Stack HPC's Azimuth, which we hope will solve most of our issues as well as benefiting from many new and really useful features that Azimuth, Azimuth can provide for us. So I'll pass over to Matt now to talk about Azimuth. Thanks, Matt. Um, so yeah, I work for a company called Stack HPC. We build clouds for people, um, specifically people who work in HPC and AI. Um, and so we want these things to be performant. We also want these things to be usable by scientists um, rather than sysadmins. This is why we built the portal Azimuth. Um, so Azimuth is open source, uh, currently builds on top of OpenStack clouds. Um, but it has a focus on platforms instead of machines and volumes and networks. Um, what this means is we can make it easier for users to quickly stand up the things they actually need, like a Jupyter Hub or an R Studio server. Um, and the other thing we've integrated into this is a an application proxy. So this is what makes our platforms secure by default. So we have a prox an application proxy that handles single sign-on TLS. Um, and also allows the platforms to run in an isolated network behind a NAT or a firewall um, without having to allow direct access, which is quite nice for security. Um, so the other thing we have here is improved Kubernetes support. So we've pulled the Kubernetes support out of the CAS system. We're now using something called Cluster API to do this, and it allows us to do all these nice things that aren't really very well supported in the existing CAS system, like auto scaling, auto healing. We've got a, an improved monitoring stack. 
Um, we can do rolling upgrades to new Kubernetes versions, that just works. Um, and the new, because we're using a lot more upstream code, instead of rolling our own stuff, we can get new Kubernetes versions much faster. Um, and we've also implemented first class support for the Kubernetes apps. So things like JupyterHub, Dask Hub, Kubeflow, you can deploy these onto an existing Kubernetes cluster or make a new one. Um, we also support workstations, Slurm and R Studio appliances as well. So, so I thought since uh, people might know that I used to work for Jasmine and I was the original author of the cloud portal. Um, so I think it's worth paying a bit of homage to the sort of um, legacy of Azimuth because it basically is a fork of the Jasmine cloud portal. So um, in 2016, we had the first Jasmine cloud portal that was on the vCloud director cloud, which is horrible. Um, and then in 2017, we decided to move to OpenStack. Yay, we've, all, we've got an interface that other people actually use, which is nice. Um, and then in 2019, as Matt alluded to, the cluster as a service system was developed. I was working for Jasmine at the time, but Stack HPC were contractors on that project. So, um, and then in, 20, uh, in 2021, when I moved to Stack HPC, we forked the Jasmine Cloud portal. And with funding from Iris, we started to develop it into what's become Azimuth. And so the first thing we did was develop the Zenith application proxy that I spoke about. And this allows us to provide, in the first instance, we use this to provide secure web consoles. Um, and then in, later in 2021, we decided we wanted something that wasn't branded Jasmine anymore. So we've detached our fork and rebranded it. And we integrated our Slurm appliance at this point, which is a significant step on from the appliance that was used in the CAS. And then in 2022, we, we started doing native Kubernetes using cluster API, and we were securing all our platform services at this point with the application proxy. And then at this, uh, before this, we were still doing all the lists of things in tables like, um, uh, like the existing cloud portal does. But we decided that wasn't very friendly for users. So we migrated to a unified platforms interface with like, as you'll see in a minute, it has tiles for the platforms instead of a table, which is a lot nicer. Um, and the app, Kubernetes app support was developed at this point. And then in 2023, we added support for um, per tenant identity providers. So you can bring your own identity to your platforms, which is quite nice. And then, so the, uh, the plan is that, in, that by the end of the year, we'll be in production. Yeah. So. On, on Jasmine. So. And I wanted to say thank you, not just to Jasmine, but to all the other people who funded developments of Azimuth. This is a community co-developed project, open source, and all these people have contributed funding. So we're working a lot with the University of Cambridge, a company called Graphcore that builds um, AI accelerators, uh, the Iris project people might know, um, SKA have funded some of the development as well, the square kilometer array. So, and of course, Jasmine benefits from all of these developments that are being funded by other people as well as the things they're funding. So, so I'll hand over to you, Matt. To yeah. Um, so we've got a quick demo to run through, which uh, hopefully will will all work fine. It's a uh, pre-recorded. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope the quality is going to be okay because. That's not too bad. So um, here is um, Azimuth. It looks much the same as the old cloud portal did in some ways. So if I first log in and then go to a tenancy, we've got a few test ones. So the interface here, there are a few things to note. We've got the platforms tab. We've got links to documentation, the inbuilt identity provider that Matt was talking about. And we've got the quotas and then machine and volume tabs. Um, so if we just look at the some of these, so the quotas, uh, the machines, and the volumes look much as they did before. Um, and then if we go to the platforms, uh, you can see the list of um, ones here that we currently have. Um, so we'll first create um, a workstation. So this is simple. It's simply, you just need to name it and then select a size. And you can change the, the, the size of the data volume. 
So this then creates a tile, that, uh, a tile. So we can see if we go on the details, we can see that it started to create. Um, and uh, uh, we can also start creating a Kubernetes cluster while that's going as well. So again, we need to name it uh, and then select the version of Kubernetes that we want, uh, select a size for the control plane. And then we need to create a node group um, to add the Kubernetes workers. So again, we need to name and then select the size for the workers. And we can also enable auto scaling, which will change the number of uh, nodes as the uh, as the as the load changes on the server. We can also enable Kubernetes ingress if we need it uh, through an available IP in, in the tenancy. So skip ahead um, not too long now for the workstation to be ready. And then, uh, so if we if we then go in and have a look. Uh, seeing that it's stating that it's ready now from this panel, we can update any options that we are, are available in that platform. In this case, you can't. And then you can patch from this interface as well. So then the, the workstation is quite nice because it, it, it gives you a browser-based shell and, and desktop, which uh, are logged in with using Zenith. Um, so then we can go and delete this platform and then skip ahead some time to wait for the Kubernetes cluster to create. So the Kubernetes clusters on Jasmine generally take about six minutes. Yeah, it's pretty, which is quite nice. It's not faster than the old system. <laughs> well. So from here, you can download the kubeconfig file if you want to, it to, in a time where you to deploy things onto the cluster from your own machine. And then we've got the Kubernetes dashboard available uh, as well, which if you've ever used it, it's, it's just the, the standard thing. So for example, you can go and have a look at all, all of the namespaces, all of the stuff that's already pre-installed. We can also add platforms on top of this. So using Dask Hub as an example here, um, all you need to do is select the cluster you want it to deploy to, deploy to change any options that you want to do. Um, so again, we'll, we'll sk skip ahead some time. It takes about uh, just under a minute to install. Uh, it just installs using Helm. Here you see it's uh, now installed. So we can use Zenith to log in to... Um, so you'll to notice this hub. is authenticated you with your OpenStack user without you doing anything. Yeah. So that means each OpenStack user gets their own notebook pod, which is quite nice. Yeah. And that's handled by Zenith. Yeah. But we don't have to do it that way. Um, once this is done, um, we can go out and create um, non-Jasmine users through the user management. So this is uh, quite simple. Um, so if we go on to the identity provider, and then uh, <laughs> open this. So uh, each tenancy gets their own key, key cloak realm. Yep. Um, so we, we can create a test user here. We need to add them to Dask Hub group so that that user gets access to that platform. And then I just need to save this. I just need to add a, pla a password so that I can use it to log in. So then if we go back to Azimuth um, and to the platform, we can copy the link from the, for the notebook. And then I'm just going to switch to the incognito tab so that I'm not logged in to Azimuth. And we can go here and ask me to log in. Which you like it um it didn't do before because I was already logged in and um, sign in and it does the same as it um as uh, as it was before. So you can see in the top right hand side that yeah, it's now it's not, now the, the key cloak user. Yeah. So yeah, which is uh, nice and easy. Uh so we think that this is quite an exciting change. Um, hopefully it's going to give a lot of fl flexibility um, with a much more robust service than we currently have, um, including having a 
monthly release um, cycle with new versions uh, that are available more quickly. For example, um, Kubernetes uh, 1.27 is the, the version we're on. We actually just released yesterday and 1.28 is okay. it now. So we'll yeah. be rolling that out on the test system probably tomorrow. Uh, whereas we're quite a long way behind that in CAS um, at the moment. Um, we also, um, as Matt said, um, work that Stack HPC do for other people, we would benefit from that as well to expand what's available in our version of Azimuth. Um, so uh, quite a, a potentially exciting thing that we could add is uh, we've been speaking to Stack HPC a little bit about uh, their plans to have a hybrid cloud capability. So we're going to uh, maybe investigate that with them. And then um, finally, um, if you'd like to get involved with helping us test it, um, it uh, just let, let us know through the help desk. And feedback through this is through um, the GitHub pages that um, Matt mentioned yesterday. So I'm happy to take any questions now. Uh, Jupyter Notebook, you start up. What kind of kernels do they have access to? Can you kind of load kernels onto them so you've got Python values to save them for you? Um, so the, I know that the, the, there's two options on the platform. So the, the one that I created was um, the Dask Hub, which we currently have as Pangeo. Um, then the other one is a, um, a plain vanilla one, which it's is very minimal, yeah. yeah. The way it's set up, though, you can pick install from inside your notebook if you want to. So, you know, a lot of notebooks that you see, they'll have a bang pip install as their first cell. And that, you, you can do that. Yeah, so the, well, the same sort of way that the, the Jasmine notebooks do, but allows um, the cloud tenants to have non-Jasmine users or just there are um, an isolated um, thing for them to The use. other thing is the operator who defines the, the available platforms can say what image they want to use for, the, for that platform as well. It's not a choice for the user yet. We are actually developing support for Binder Hub, which will bring that. So any Binder compatible Git repository, you would be able to launch. So. <clears throat> Would there be any kind of training to how to use this? Because I'm definitely very interested in Kubernetes and don't know the first thing about it. So it'd be quite cool to try and test it. But is there like information available by Justin with that kind of thing? I don't know. Um, so we would definitely plan to have some training for Azimuth. Um, I, I don't know if we would do Kubernetes training, but we could consider it. Um, would say about Kubernetes is there are a lot of very good tutorials out there about it. There's also a lot of very good trainers as well. So yeah. we at Stack HBC don't actually do Kubernetes training for our clients either. We there's loads of good companies. We used Jetstack in the past. Their training is great. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. It's it, quite a saturated space, and it's a lot of effort. <laughs> for not so much payback when really good stuff already exists, if you know what I mean. So, but certainly assembling a list of pointers to places to look is what yeah. we could look at yeah, doing that for sure. Yeah. And we would point that point to that stuff through our um, help, help docs as well. If, if there was sufficient demand, would it coordinate the training event? That's all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that might be a good option because it would allow individuals who were interested to maybe get like a group a group discount from going through organized training by a Jasmine, which would be quite nice. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, So with the commercial cloud, you obviously pay per use of storage mm -hmm. for 
computer, etc. Is there a billing model associated with this, or is there a quota of how much you can use in a particular period? Or how does that side of it work? Um, so how our cloud works is um, as long as you have the right funding or um, you bought into having a cloud tenancy, you have a quota that you um, can use uh, as much as you like. And there are no uh, there are no restrictions about how much you use it, as, but you can't go outside your quota. But then saying that if you need more, um, you can talk to us about getting a larger quota. So there is there's a bit of a dichotomy here with a fixed capacity cloud and quote and and quotas which are which are infinite in time, right? Mm. Which is so quite a lot of cloud providers will over provision the quota because not a, because basically no one uses their whole quota all the time. So the total of the quotas will be bigger than the capacity of the cloud. Um, this can sometimes cause issues if everyone decides to use all their quota at once and you'll end up with the dreaded no valid host or whatever. Um, we actually at Stack HPC, we've been developing a solution for this for fixed capacity clouds, which works with OpenStack. It's called Blazar. It's an upstream OpenStack project. What this does is basically it allows you to say, I would like X CPUs, Y RAM, you know, Z storage from date one to date two. And I'm that's I'm gonna book that in advance and it's mine. And then what Blazar does is shop is allows people to sort of fit their reservation. They're, these things are called reservations and you can kind of fit them together like Tetris blocks to try and make best use of your cloud. So we're planning to integrate this into Azimuth. So when you deploy a platform, you'll say how big you want it to be. And Azimuth will say, well, you can have that in two weeks, right? And then you might go back and make it smaller. And Azimuth will say, well, you can have that now. So that's the plan for us for Azimuth. Whether Jasmine adopts Blazar is another question. But um, these, this th these things exist. So this is work that's being funded by Cambridge. Um, and well, we're doing it for Cambridge via probably Iris funding, I think. So um, this is something that Jasmine could benefit from if they were interested in installing Blazor. I don't know if it's supported in Vio, probably not. Yeah, but certainly like what we do with our cloud, we are we are talking to people about what the future of our cloud is going to look like. So yeah, and which we don't know at the moment. This this illusion the public clouds give of being essentially infinite it it doesn't hold on a cloud the size of of Jasmine yeah so it's a tricky problem. Any more questions? It's worth noting it actually doesn't hold on public cloud anymore. If you ask for an H one hundred, you'll quite often get told which is Nvidia's latest graphics card. You'll quite often get told there's none available. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hi, this looks amazing. And um, I just wonder what your users are generally using clusters for, like Kubernetes clusters and your cats. Yeah, so um, at the moment, um, we do have a few tenants using CAS. Um, most of them use it for either Kubernetes to deploy their own services on or use it for um, the Pangeo Dask hub type and things, um, but I uh, well, um, most of the tenants in terms of the the number of the tenants aren't using the cluster system, and hopefully with it being more accessible through Azimuth, um, more people will um, uptake it. So at the moment, um, you have to opt in to use our cluster system, but I think with Azimuth we will make it available to all external tenants. And do you have a typical use case for the Kubernetes clusters? Um, not really. Um, apart from the Jupyter Hub type, type work that most tenants will do. Um, but for example, um, um, the data labs guys are interested in that they currently deploy their own Kubernetes onto machines, but they have been interested in um, and I think successfully deployed um, that onto Q Q Kubernetes with Azimuth. Uh, it's because 
our cloud is used by such a variety of people. We don't really have the oversight exactly of what people are using things for. Thanks. Any more questions? It would be interesting to find out what people are using it for. Well, that's part yeah. of what we're going to do. So. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, part of the point of cloud is that the operator doesn't have to necessarily be that bothered. I mean, AWS doesn't care what you do on their machines, right? So, yeah. I think the point is that we're always interested to hear what people tell us. You don't have to wait for us to ask you what people are using. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah. And also, if there's other platforms you want to make available, yeah, that you, that would be useful to you. Let Jasmine know, and there might be something we can do to make those available as well. Yeah, definitely.